Yeah. Uh, very good morning to all. On behalf of uh, EGS Pillai Group of Institutions and EGS Pillai Engineering College, I welcome all the participants. I welcome the today's speaker, Dr. Sri Harshanandam. I welcome Dr. Irvina Abzan from Multimedia University. I welcome Dr. Swaroop from Southeastern University of Sri Lanka. Before going for the event, I will like to just briefly introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Sri Harshanandam. He is a young scientist and a researcher at Hans Suhe Institute of Technology. He was awarded PhD in the group of uh, Professor Fast Han at Technical University, Dunster. He did his uh, bachelor and masters at uh, IIT Madras, uh, number one technical institute in India, ranking for the last four years consecutively. Currently, Dr. Harshanandam is doing postdoctoral research at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology with Professor Horst Han. Professor Horst Han research unit at Institute of Nanotechnology focuses primarily on nanostructured materials. And also the current topics uh, they are doing research is on uh, development of mixer ionic and the electronically conducive conductive functional cathode material for high temperature fuel cells, gas phase synthesis of functional oxide nanoparticle as active sensor material and catalyst supports and their thermal stability, mechanical properties and super plasticity of nanostructured materials. And also they are doing research on PVD coating of nanomaterials, use of pulses, microsecond pulses for the controlled deposition of new complex metastable nanostructures. And also they are doing research on synthesis of conductive oxides with tunable electronic and magnetic properties. The research group, Professor Post Hand Research Group has a lot of patents and numerous researchers and they are the leading research group on materials, particularly on nanomaterials. Uh, with this few uh, 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 introduction, I would like to request uh, Professor Dr. Farooq uh, from Southeastern University to welcome Dr. Harsha. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siva. On behalf of the Southeastern University of Sri Lanka, I would I like to welcome Sri uh, Harshanandam, Doctor, and uh, uh, other sponsors. Dr. Irvina Efsan and uh, needless to say Dr. Siva for taking this initiative on a continuous basis. So the topic we are in is basically materials. And all of us know without materials, whatever the engineering it is, you need to have materials. So the development of materials, also the development of other fields, not only in engineering, even other areas. Now we know, now we use materials, particularly refractory materials for space on spacecraft. And now we have been uh, talking about, last time we were talking about magnesium alloys. It has revolutionized. Now the vehicles, now for example, take the vehicles, the heavy weight vehicles have become lightweight and still they are stronger and stronger. So the continuous progress in developing materials is pushing the people to move forward in, in other areas as well. So I welcome you once again, Dr. Sri Harsanandam to deliver your lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now I request Dr. Irvina Abzan, please. Uh, okay. Um, on behalf of uh, Multimedia University, uh, I also would like to thanks to um, uh, EGS Pile, uh, Prof. Siva Raman, 
uh, Prof. Farouk, um, and also our speakers, uh, Dr. Afsha, uh, uh, for this um, webinar, international webinar, which is the topic on the metallic glass for engineering and biomedical applications. Um, the same thing, a material is very important uh, and every day uh, they have a lot of um, uh, research uh, updates on the materials. We hope that uh, with this webinar topic, um, all of you can um, uh, get or gain some uh, knowledge and we can have uh, more other research uh, in the future after this. Um, and also we hope uh, on behalf of Multimedia University, uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Afsha uh, to give a speech on this uh, webinar topic. Thank you. Now, uh, the session is over to Dr. Tarsha. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll start my screen sharing. I hope it will work. Uh, so, can you all hear me and can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. please proceed. Uh, okay, thank you. So thank you all for uh, attending this webinar. Uh, so in the next uh, uh, 40 minutes or so, I'll try to uh, explain to you well, what are metallic glasses and uh, how they can be helpful in um, most engineering applications, mostly mechanical applications, okay? And biomedical uh, applications also, which will be the last uh, few slides of my presentation, okay? Uh, and uh, before I start, I can tell you that I work in uh, Institute of Nanotechnology, which is in Germany, uh, in Karlsruhe. It's in the Black Forest. Uh, it's a nice place to visit, uh, and uh, uh, it's a wonderful place to do research and all. So um, before I go ahead, I'll just explain to you what are metallic glasses. Uh, uh, to start with, metallic glasses are basically uh, metals, so they look like normal metals. So you can see on the right side, you look like this is a metallic glass. Uh, they are opaque. Although uh, one when 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 one says glass, people think it's just the window glass. Uh, but you can also make glasses out of metals, and they are called metallic glasses because they are simply amorphous in nature. So when you look at um, uh, this uh, piece of uh, glass into uh, into a T transmission electron microscope, you see something like this with uh, no ordering in the structure. Here, each dot is an atom in the left side image. So uh, you can see that there is no periodic order. So that's why it's amorphous. And then uh, since it's made of metals, you call it a metallic glass. Uh, there's one more point which people normally do not necessarily consider all the time for metallic glasses. That was... Uh, uh, that glass should show a glass transition temperature. Okay, um, this is also one of the fundamental definitions initially. Um, but uh, sometimes people, uh, if, they, if the material is amorphous, they can still call it a glass for some reason. Um, um, but when you make silicon, pure silicon amorphous, you don't call it a glass, you call it amorphous silicon. So the definition is a bit um, um, on uh, is a bit gray in that region. However, the take home message from this slide is that if you have a metal, if you have an amorphous structure made out of metals, you can call it principally a glass. And uh, mechanically, why are they interesting? They are interesting because if you see this picture on the left side, which is the ASP plot, which you will see in many uh, uh, papers. Uh, this is one of the most famous uh, figures uh, where you see there's a lot of materials here. You have magnesium alloys, aluminum alloys, tin alloys, lead alloys, beryllium steels. So you have all kinds of alloys here and there are many more polymers and other things. Uh, if you see uh, among all these things, all the dark circles here on the top, they are all metallic glasses. And you see that the glasses have really high strengths and they almost have comparable moduli with the crystalline materials. 
but the strengths are very high. So in that sense, glasses have really high strengths. That's one of the most in crucial part, although they don't have any structure. Uh, and but the thing is, when you look at their fracture toughness, which is also another important uh, criteria for uh, metals, uh, in the fracture toughness, you can see that they have a wide range of fracture toughness values. You see the fracture toughness varies from 100 uh, here to almost to magnesium uh, and iron based glasses. This one, it's like one megapascal. It's, it's almost it's less than even ceramics. So they are very, very brittle here, but they are very ductile here. So you they can vary from completely brittle materials to completely ductile, although they are metallic. So, but the strengths are also very high. This is a very interesting uh, feature of mechanical properties in metallic glasses. So this is the reason why people want to study mechanical properties in general. And these are also very, mechanical behavior is also very important in uh, biomedical applications because uh, you need strength for the material to survive inside the body. So uh, with, with this, I will just try to, just in a quick slide, I will, this, you, many of you may know already, uh, I'll just try to just recap uh, very quickly uh, what you understand by mechanical properties and what kind of data information you get uh, from a test, from a, let's say, uniaxial tensile test of a crystalline sample. If you see this, uh, you must have seen this figure many times uh, that uh, you, if you do a tensile test of a dog bone specimen of a crystalline sample, you have an elastic region, then a plastic region, which is strain hardening compound uh, happens. And then finally, you'll have reached the ultimate tensile strength and then failure occurs. And the strain hardening is uh, attributed to the dislocation density increase in this region. And uh, you, once you get this curve, you can uh, estimate the yield strength, the ultimate tensile strength from the slope of this curve. You can get the Young's modulus, the area under the elastic, elastic gives you the area under the whole curve will give you the toughness of the material. So you get a whole lot of information just from one experiment. Um, uh, the, there are other properties also which uh, we don't necessarily, uh, which I'm not going to talk about in this uh, uh, webinar, is uh, fatigue is one and creep is one. Creep is nothing but the high temperature deformation and fatigue is something where you do cyclic loading below the yield stress. So these two properties I'm not going to touch upon. High temperature deformation, I'm going to give you one slide of how high temperature deformation of glasses happen. And normally for all these kind of tests, you keep the, the parameters are constant. You keep the strain rate is fixed in this experiment and also the temperature is normally room temperature, right? So this is some, some basic outline of how you see it. Now the thing is why you see this kind of behavior in the crystalline material. This also you might be knowing uh, from metallurgists, this is very important. Uh, why deformation happens in crystalline materials. It happens because of uh, some basic mechanisms like slip and twinning. And uh, which materials give you which kind of mechanism depends on several factors. Uh, normally, if the material has low stacking fault energy, you, see, you can see me mechanisms like pinning. And if the material has high uh, stacking fault energy, normally they go by slip. And the material should have higher number of uh, should have enough number of uh, slip systems so that uh, this can happen. And a slip is nothing but like in this slide, in this top part of the picture where you see the dislocation moving to the right and finally forming a surface step. And if you see in the tension uh, uh, specimen, if you see you pull the specimen this way, then the material just slips like that in arrays. And you see such kind of slip steps. Whereas if you have a twinning, when you push the material, you'll have two twin planes and the material just deforms this way. So this is how uh, deformation in a crystalline material will proceed. And there is an order in the crystalline material. You see the, lat the atomic planes are stacked in order. Whereas in amorphous materials, uh, this is not the case. So uh, first of all, before I go into the structure, I'll just uh, give you how the deformation behavior looks in a metallic glass in general, okay? Uh, you've, now you, I've shown you the deformation behavior of crystalline material. Whereas in the amorphous material, if you see the tensile test, uh, normally it only shows up to the yield point and then they fail. They have absolutely no, ten no tensile ductility. So there is no plastic region at all in a metal glass. In compression test also, if the glass is brittle, I, I told you that the fracture toughness values can vary quite a lot. So some of them are really brittle. Even in compression, they don't have any ductility. Then they fail like this only. 
However, there are some classes which you can tune and you can get some plasticity out of it. In such classes, you have a linear elastic regime and then you have a plastic regime, but the plastic regime does not show any strain hardening component like you see in the crystalline material. So it's absolutely flat. Uh, so this is quite uh, interesting because the glasses, uh, why don't they show any strain hardening component? And if you look closely, if you look closely into the linear portion, in the, into the flat portion here, you'll actually see that there are these kind of load drops. This, there is a serrated behavior. And this behavior comes because of the shear band uh, generation in the glasses, which is what I'm going to talk about later on. So there is a lot of uh, change in deformation here. So the glasses behave differently compared to a normal crystalline solid. So that's the take home message from the slide that you have no plasticity in um, uh, tension, but in compression, some glasses show plasticity. Okay. And with this, I then move on to how deformation uh, occurs in an amorphous material. Okay. Now, uh, first you have to understand that in a crystalline material, you have, let's say you look at this uh, picture here, here, you see these uh, each, uh, each uh, mm, ball here is, a, is an atom and the lines are just guidelines to your eye. So the, uh, you have a structure like that, a lattice structure like that. And when you pull the structure in the vertical direction, you get something like B. So the atoms are pulled in the vertical direction and then they are uh, compressed in the horizontal direction. So this is how you expect uh, a, a, a deformation to proceed in a crystalline material, which is very trivial, right? It's very easy to understand. However, in an amorphous material, if you look at it, it has, like I told you, it has no structure. So the structure is uh, quite, uh, there is no symmetry. So the atoms can be anywhere here. If you see this grid is only again a guideline to the eye uh, to understand that there is a change in movement. Uh, and these each ball is a, an atom here. And if you see, if you pull this material in the vertical direction again, each atom need not necessarily move exactly in the pull direction. You see this atom moved this way and this one moved backwards. So they can move in different directions. However, the cumulative movement of all the atoms will be along the vertical direction, whereas the local movements are very different. This is a very, very important aspect because in a crystalline material, if you want to say elastic modulus, Young's modulus is in a way directly dependent on the bonding of the material. So if the bond is strong, your Young's modulus is high. If the bond is weak, the Young's modulus is low. So when you pull the material and, and everywhere the, uh, the modulus in theory at least is the same in a crystalline material. Whereas in an amorphous material, everywhere the local elastic constants, the local elastic moduli is different because somewhere it is more, somewhere it is less. So you have a distribution of elastic moduli, which is also an important uh, thing to understand in amorphous materials. So uh, this is how generally how the, uh, if you just uh, from a very basic uh, way, if you think about it, this is how it will be uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a glass. Uh, but to understand it a little bit more, this is just a schematic to give you some idea, uh, but to go into a bit into detail, uh, although there is no structure of metallic glasses, like I said, uh, there is no periodic order, uh, if you want to correlate a property to a material, to the, to, to the material uh, structure, you have to somehow, although there is no periodic structure, you need to find some structure, right? So this is what has, this is the uh, major uh, bit of research going on in the last uh, decade or so. This is, if you look at any glass literature, the major uh, research area is finding order in disorder. Okay. And uh, if you go remember your high school um, science, you will know that uh, all solids have, uh, you would have read that all solids have some order and all uh, liquids have short range order and all gases have no order at all. And glass is essentially a configurationally frozen liquid. So it has the same structure as a liquid. So you have, you should have some short range order like a liquid. So this is what you see here. You have short range order in the glass 
and when when i mean by short range order what i mean by that is the just the first nearest neighboring shell so you have a central atom here you can see and you have atoms around it so this is the first nearest neighboring shell uh the so this is uh, the size of this uh, short range order is in a few angstroms not more than that so because you are talking about interatomic distances almost and uh, different uh, forget about these numbers these are all a bit complicated for this but what i would like to you to focus on is this coordination number if you look at uh, a crystalline material let's say copper copper is face centered cubic and in a face centered cubic copper uh, each copper atom is surrounded by 12 copper atoms and everywhere in the material it's the same there is no change in coordination number whereas in a glass if you see there is a wide range of coordination numbers you have nickel boron nickel phosphorus nickel zirconium platinum nickel niobium these are all different kinds of glasses and each glass has different different coordination number at different different re local regions so you can have different kinds of coordination number so essentially the bonding everywhere is not the same some some portions are loosely packed some are densely packed so uh, it's quite a very different scenario compared to a crystalline material uh, but essentially but the point i would like to highlight is that there is some short range order and then there is also some medium range order what i mean is uh, medium range order is in the size of 1 to 2 nanometers that's all and then it ends and uh, this people try to correlate by saying that you have these kind of uh, short range order clusters and these clusters can be joined together at a at a at a point like this vertex or at a side or at a face so you can join them like at a uh, vertex here or at a line here or at a side here it's a bit complicated to understand but the point i would like to highlight is that this kind of ordering of the clusters also can happen in the size range of let's say 1 to 2 nanometers and beyond this there is essentially no information on how the order proceeds okay so this is how roughly the structure of a glass will be with this uh, then uh, how do you understand mechanical deformation here now i told you that the glasses don't have any structure but i told you that they have short range order and they also have a medium range order so to understand uh, structure uh, in uh, metallic materials uh, in crystalline materials sorry uh, one understands deformation by dislocation movement so you have dislocations mostly and these dislocations have <coughs> are nothing but a row of uh, vacancies basically and the movement of dislocations gives you uh, the plastic deformation and uh, dislocations are lar very mobile so they move from one end of the crystal to the other end so and the activation energy for a dislocation is uh, like 0.01 electron volts roughly whereas in a glass so since it doesn't have any order you don't necessarily see what is the deformation unit also so people have come up with some models they have come up with two models and the first one is a shear transformation zone model which is the one of the most widely accepted one okay and in this uh, they define a shear transformation zone as something where you have a cluster of atoms each ball is an atom here the color is just to indicate that these uh, this is one kind of a plane sort of and this is another kind so when you apply a shear these top three layers of atom move to the left and the bottom three move to the right and then you get some kind of a deformation here this is what i mean by this is what i want to represent by the color so this is this this movement of atoms in two different layers gives you something called a shear transformation zone and this is regarded as the fundamental unit of deformation in a metallic glass and this is in the a range of 100 atoms so you are dealing in something like 1 to 2 nanometers in the medium range order zone however in this medium range order like i told you you have the short range order clusters and the short range order clusters can have different kinds of coordination so the some are loosely packed some are uh, densely packed so that loosely packed clusters would be the one which deform more quickly okay that's the one point i want to highlight from this slide 
and uh, the another important thing i have to tell you is that the this unit if you look if you take a crystalline material and look it into a if you look it under a microscope you will definitely see um, uh, dislocations and all those things whereas in a glass uh, if you take a glass deformed glass and try to look for a shear transmission zone it will not be easy to resolve because they also look like some kind of uh, amorphous structures only so that's the point uh, i would like to highlight so it's not easy to uh, directly visualize shear transmission zones the second kind of model is much more uh, based on is uh, some kind of a diffusive jump model um, this is much more uh, relatively easy to understand as well so you, when you have a cluster of atoms like this you have an atom in the center Uh, and this atom may have a vacancy here so when you apply that let's say temperature gradient this atom can move to this vacancy and come back move this to this vacancy and come back which is what you see in a diffusion so there is no driving force to go this way but when you apply a shear to this uh, cluster there is a driving force towards the direction of the shear so the activation energy jumps towards that side so the atom then moves forward so this kind of uh, diffusive uh, jumps also would give you some kind of a deformation in the glass this is the second model although this is not uh, um, let's say not uh, uh, so popular the model is very e easy to understand and it's the mathematical equations describing the model to understand the deformation mechanism is much more easy so this model is uh, that's why important and now you have a shear transmission zone which is what i have uh, shown here let's say let's forget about this model for a while but uh, you can go to this one so you have a shear transmission zone that's the basic unit so on a, in a local cluster a uh, few atoms have moved sheared and now these shear transmission zones this is an md simulation work because um, experimentally these are very hard to see but in an md simulation these can be done and in, in these md simulations you can see each uh, this big ball is a shear transformation zone this big ball is a shear transformation zone and when you have such kind of shear transformation zones they actually sort of rotate in some direction and uh, propagate the deformation so what happens is these shear transformation zones sort of combine together to form such kind of uh, bands you see in this right side image you see there are some small red zero zones which are forming which are the shear transmission zone sort of and they are combining together to form such kind of long bands and these bands are what are creating the instability in the material and this instability in the material is causing the material to shear quickly and fail and that is why when you pull the material in tension these bands form very quickly and the bands have a lot of free volume or a lot of voids in the bands and if you remember your tensile testing in uh, crystalline materials you know that at the necking region uh, the neck forms and along with the neck you have a lot of void formation once the void formation starts the strain rates at those local regions are extremely high and the material breaks so that's what happens here also that when you have these shear bands forming they create a lot of voids and the void formation is what is giving no ductility for the metallic glass at all so this is a very important observe important uh, information to carry on and once you get that and finally you'll have failure so in a nutshell uh, this is how the deformation progresses this is just a sort of like a, a summary slide for you to understand how the deformation is proceeding so you have a shear transformation zone with uh, which is happening here in different uh, we, you have such kind of uh, sheared regions in the material and these sheared regions will each here each uh, ball is again a shear transformation zone and they all call and they all coalesce coal or uh, cooperatively move to form a mature shear band and once you form a band they immediately break and you get such kind of uh, failure very quickly and during the break breaking of this band they actually break at a very high velocity they almost travel at the velocity of sound so when when a material or when a band travels at that velocity you generate a lot of temperature in that band and this was verified by a very nice experiment here uh, shown uh, in the group of uh, professor greer 
in uh, Cambridge University, they have done amazingly good work where they have taken a metallic glass and a three point bending system like this. And they have applied tin coating on this side of the specimen. Uh, sorry, this is a four point bending. And then they uh, put some notches and then they bend the sample. And as you all know, melting point of tin is 504 degree, 504 Kelvin. Uh, so when the melting point is so much, uh, if you um, generate a band and if the band is catastrophic like what I showed before, then there must be some temperature rise and the temperature rise would cause the tin to melt. And that would give you such kind of, if you see this uh, bottom picture here, that would give you this kind of tiny droplets. Okay, The tin melted and formed these droplets. And that indicated to them that the uh, band has a higher temperature. So this is a very nice experiment to understand that shear bonds show uh, uh, excessive rise in temperatures. And then this is the one slide I'm, I told I would <coughs> I'll explain to you about uh, the uh, high temperature behavior of uh, metallic glasses. Uh, and this is also very important. This is important because uh, if you go to a glass blowing workshop uh, of a normal uh, window glass, I mean, normal glasses, if you have seen, if you see, go to a glass blowing workshop, uh, this is what they're essentially doing. What they do is they take the glass, take it to high temperature, some temperature above glass transition. And then if you blow into the glass, the glass sort of takes a shape. So th this happens at only high temperature. So similarly, if you see, I told you metallic glasses have absolutely no uh, ductility in tension. But above the glass transition temperature, you see this is a palladium nickel phosphorus metallic glass. And above the glass transition temperature, this specimen, this dark bone specimen has deformed like 400%. So there is a, an enormous ductility here. So this is what is being used in these kind of components. If you see this, uh, uh, this is thermoplastic molding where you take a glass and then uh, you heat it to high temperature. And this temperature, uh, the glass is sort of like a viscous liquid and you can just press the glass into different shapes like the one here, you can make a bowl kind of here. And this is very, very uh, fascinating to understand. And the, one of the reasons is that there are no catastrophic shear bands and the material is sort of like a viscous liquid. So it's sort of like a homogeneous deformation. Okay? So it's a very important uh, application of uh, uh, metallic glasses. And this is very crucial in the biomedical devices also, which I'll come by the end of the talk, where uh, this can be used for uh, uh, for uh, for increasing the roughness of the film, which is what I'll, uh, I'll come later. And uh, uh, now we understood uh, that glasses, that deformation of the temperature, deformation of glasses at room temperature, I told you the deformation at high temperatures, and then this is a very normal thing of uh, once you uh, you want to have some kind of a diagram or a map, just by looking at the diagram, you know how the deformation can proceed. So these are deformation maps in metallic glasses. You would have probably seen them in crystalline materials also, uh, because uh, crystalline materials also, uh, MF Ashby has provided these maps. He is the first one to do it. And uh, this is, these are very, very important. And then uh, for uh, metallic glasses, uh, Franz Papen has done this. And in this, uh, don't worry about too many details, but the most important point is that uh, if you see the glass has a certain uh, shear stress in the top, and then the glass here, this line is done at a certain strain rate, okay? And at this strain rate, let's say the one on the top, uh, almost at the below the glass transition, here is the glass transition temperature, the one on the bottom, and this is the crystallization temperature, this dotted line. And below the glass transition temperature, the glass is pre essentially, where the shear stress does not change at all. So it's essentially uh, shear insensitive to temperature. And then once it classes the glass transition temperature, like I told you, the deformation has a lot of, uh, uh, it can undergo a lot of deformation. It's practically the deformation is like uh, the the strain rate sensitivity here is almost unity. Okay. 
So you have an inhomogeneous flow here and then you have a homogeneous flow in this region. So this is what uh, is what I have want you to understand. And then if you see the strain rate sensitivity at room temperature, it's practically strain rate insensitive because at 10 power minus one, minus four, minus eight, these are like seven orders of magnitude. And then the stray, the stress change is absolutely uh, very minimal uh, at room temperature. So if you see, this is how generally the behavior of glasses is. And this is again based on the diffusive jump model, which I told you, the second model, which was not very popular. However, this is a very easy model to, uh, to do some uh, calculations because the model is based on diffusion. So what I've told you right now is glasses have uh, uh, glasses undergo plastic deformation, but they're relatively most of them are very brittle, but some glasses show some ductility in compression, but many of them even don't show ductility in compression. So to overcome that, uh, many people have the most of the glass literature is based is uh, uh, is is focused on improving the ductility in these glasses. Okay, or the plasticity in these glasses. Uh, some try to do it in tension, some try to do it in bending, some try to do it in uh, compression. Okay, but tension is one of the uh, least uh, work cases because of many of the glasses fail in tension. So people haven't worked so much on tension, but compression and bending people have done quite a lot. So there are five or let's say roughly categorized, we can have five different solutions to this problem. The first one is the bulk metallic glass composites where you have a secondary crystalline phase in the material. You can see the microstructure here. You have nice dendrites which are forming and the black region is the amorphous phase. So this is one kind of microstructure. And this, this is a crystalline dispersion in an amorphous matrix. And here you have a phase separated metallic glass where you have an amorphous region inside an amorphous region. So this is one amorphous region, this bright region. The dark uh, matrix is also an amorphous region. So this is uh, uh, two amorphous phases dispersed in the matrix. And the third one is a composition specific metallic glass, which I will come, uh, come to in the next few slides. And the next one is a severe plastic deformation of metallic glasses where you do, um, you take a metallic glass and then you do some, con some kind of a treatment like a short pinning uh, or high pressure torsion or something like that. And then you can also generate some inhomogeneities in the sample. And the final one is a nano glass, where, which is what I was uh, working on, where you have, um, 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 and it's like nano crystalline material where you have the, instead of grain boundaries, you have glassy boundaries. And this is one of the more, another important um, mechanism or my important strategy. So I'll just, just briefly discuss all these things and uh, go to the biomedical part, which are in the last portion. Um, uh, the bulk metallic glass composites, and this is the composition which they have worked on. The strategy here is very simple. The strategy here is that the, if you remember your uh, fracture toughness measurements, uh, uh, you do by Charpy test or something, where you have this uh, plastic zone in the Charpy test where you have the KC square by two pi sigma square, and uh, they calculated the fracture toughness or radius of plastic zone for this composition and they found it was like 200 microns. So if you can disperse your uh, crystalline dispersions within less than 200 microns, then the band which forms does not catastrophically transfer uh, throughout the sample. So it is immediately obstructed by the, the crystalline dispersion. So that's what they have taken advantage of and they have done. This is one of the very few cases where they have shown tensile ductility. You can clearly see that they have shown this kind of, uh, and they have shown necking in the sample, which is very, very rare in a metallic glass. Uh, so this is one of the very few experiments which was successful. And they have done that by semi-solid processing. Okay. And if you see the fracture toughness of these glasses, they are like very, very high. Almost in this these black uh, dots here, that shows the new bulk metallic glass composite. So you have crystalline dispersion in an amorphous matrix here. Then you have a phase separated glass, which I talked about, uh, where you have amorphous phase dispersed in an amorphous phase. And you see the, before compression, you see the glass and after compression, you see that it almost became a flat surface. You can also see that in the stress strain curve. 
so this is an amorphous dispersion and an amorphous matrix so this is the logic that the shear bands are not propagating because you have a second phase which is the other amorphous phase which is obstructing it and the next one is a composition specific glass this is somewhat debatable uh, concept because uh, um, there are other in the next slide i'll show another group which actually counters this point the idea of this uh, composition specific glass is that you take uh, if, you, if you i don't know how many of you do mechanical uh, behavior but here if you take the shear modulus the bulk modulus uh, values you say 1 minus 2 v v with, this is the poisson ratio by 1 plus nu and if the poisson ratio is high uh, then this value is low and g is low so you have the shear modulus very low when the shear modulus is low you can actually deform the material much more easily so what they have done is they have taken this composition copper zirconium aluminum nickel and they have chosen uh, they have identified three compositions where they thought the poisson ratio is quite high and from those compositions they have, have tried to do uh, bending of the samples like here they are doing 10 compression uh, you see that the material has become absolutely flat so this is quite an interesting observation and they have showed that the plasticity is uh, enormous However, uh, recently another group uh, also showed that this is not necessarily true. You need not change the Poisson's ratio. So they microalloyed the sample with, of palladium nickel phosphorus with iron and cobalt. And you see that the Poisson's ratio is essentially changing the third decimal, 0 0.002003 to 0.000. So there's no change almost. However, the compression and bending behavior of these uh, compositions, you see, uh, the palladium nickel phosphorus shows a lot of uh, ductility. Then the palladium nickel phosphorus cobalt also showed a lot of ductility, whereas palladium nickel phosphorus iron showed absolutely no ductility. So without changing the Poisson's ratio, you can also change the compression properties. So that composition specificity specific nature is being debated here. And the next one is the severe plastic deformation. Like I told, you can do short pinning or high pressure torsion. If you remember, if you know short pinning, short pinning is where you take material. This is also done for uh, crystalline materials. This is done to improve the compressive residual stresses on the surface. So you take a ball and then you hit the material with those balls at high speeds and you generate a lot of residual stress. And the residual stress gives you strain hardening and the material is uh, harder on the surface. So the material and the surfaces are the ones where you develop cracks so and when the surface is hard you are actually protecting the sample from uh, catastrophic failure so that, that is what short painting is and in the short painting they have done uh, this thing and then uh, they have showed that the plasticity improved with short painting and glasses also and then they have also done high pressure torsion where you have you take a material you apply a high load and then you torsion the material like this and in the, with that deformation, you can also generate a lot of inhomogeneity in the sample. And that inhomogeneity is giving uh, here some compressive deformation. So these are all some strategies to improve. And uh, this is the final strategy, which is what I worked on, which is the nano glasses. And the concept is very simple. The concept is like you take, if you take nanocrystalline particles and uh, you consolidate them or you compact them, between the particles, you get a grain boundary right in a crystalline material whereas in a glass we assume that between the particles you get a glassy boundary like the one here in the mi middle microstructure you get this kind of uh, glass interface and when you have such kind of interfaces these interfaces can be nucleating sites for the shear transformation zones which i talked about so these are uh, disordered regions so they can act they are loosely packed so they can move so you can generate a lot of shear transformation zones and this lot of shear transformation zones can give you enormous ductility, which is also what is shown with the tension uh, curve here. The tensile dark bone specimen, you see there is some necking here, like 17%. So this is a quite an interesting uh, observation from uh, nano glasses. By changing the composition in a very nano scale, like in 10 nanometers or so, you can generate such kind of uh, properties. Um, with this, uh, I would like to move on to the biomedical part in the last two slides. Uh, this is not what I work on, but uh, it's quite interesting to actually see. Uh, some of the important aspects which I told, like high strength and all, are needed for biomedical devices also. Because 
if you put a piece of metal inside your body and you fall down and the metal should not abruptly crack or anything so the material should have enough strength it should also have fatigue because over a period it can break so that also should not happen and another important point is that in the body there are many um, uh, different kinds of uh, chemicals sort of so you can th these chemicals can react with your uh, metal and then uh, cause corrosion so having corrosion resistance is also one of the most crucial aspect for a biomedical device and of course biocompatibility where the, the uh, body should accept that metal which is also important um and you should have some flexible chemistry wear resistance and all these things but the most important one is that uh, as far as i have understood is that um the material when you have a rough surface obviously you have more surface area so the um uh, so the bacteria or something or the or the, the the cells can come and sit on it and grow on the surface and for that you need to increase the surface area and this can be done by glasses very easily because i told you that the high temperature deformation you can always uh, get uh, the glass to flow like some sort of a semi viscous liquid so what you can do is you can take a material piece of glass take it to high temperature and then you can take a stamp like this let's say you take this stamp where you have this kind of uh, uh, very rough surface uh, you take a mold of the stamp and you stamp it and you can get such kind of a structure in the sample you generate such structures uh to through some sort of thermoplastic molding and this increases the surface area and the surface area increase would in enhance the uh, growth of cells which is what you see in here you see some kind of uh, enhancement in growth in the amorphous you can also see that on crystalline surface also so this is quite an interesting uh, uh, way of approaching uh, biomedical applications and these are some prospective applications people have tried to do uh, Uh, so they have taken uh, these kind of glasses so you have seen you can see zirconium based copper based glasses here and uh, they have put some bacteria and the silicon is the reference here they have put some bacteria here and you can see on the silicon reference the bacteria grow quite well uh, but on the zirconium based and copper based glasses uh, they have grown grow, their bacteria grow grew uh, comparatively very less and this indicates uh, that the um, glasses can be used as some kind of antibacterial coatings which is what in the one area of research is going on this way uh, there the, and recently our group has shown that in nickel niobium nano glass they can be used as some kind of glucose detectors so you can use them as some kind of uh, glucose sensor so they show enhanced uh, glucose activity uh, because of the increased surface area and roughness and uh, recently there are uh, appli applications to use them as uh, stents in heart where you have uh, when you the heart valve gets clogged or something people put stents to uh, so that the um, blood can flow through so for that stent uh, you need some kind of a solid structure which does not uh, which is very strong which does not corrode and which can stay long and for that they have tried to use bulk metallic glass and this is a modeling where they try to calculate the von mises stress distribution to see how strong it will be and this is an interesting approach to uh, go to biomedical applications uh, however uh, there are still problems although these are all the positive aspects of it the the things which are not heavily investigated are the fatigue behavior how much can the uh, uh, glasses sustain the fatigue behavior is not uh, clear till now uh, the stress corrosion uh, how how the stress will influence the corrosion over a period is also not very much studied <coughs> and also we are also not sure if there is any let's say wear and tear inside the body how the materials how the metals would react with the body so there are a lot of research problems there to be investigated in that sense so with this uh, slide i would like to finally conclude and say that i have tried to show you how the deformation proceeds in a metallic glass and how the deformation is highly localized in the metallic glass Uh, then the fundamental unit of deformation in a glass is called a shear transformation zone and these shear transformation zones join together to form a shear band and there are uh, this is the band which causes the shear instability and which causes the metallic glass to fail catastrophically
So several strategies have been conceived to improve this plasticity by generating more shear bands or by having an obstruct obstruction during the shear band movement. And uh, this strength improving aspects could play a role eventually in the potential application of uh, biomedical devices. There is still a long way to go. With that, I would like to thank you for your time. And uh, if you have more interest, please do read uh, these uh, few articles which have come up recently uh, on uh, rejuvenation of metallic glasses, how uh, cryogenic cyclic low uh, temperature, uh, cryogenic cyclic uh, temperature uh, changes can uh, give you plasticity. And also recently there's a work in the group of Greer again where they have shown that uh, in glasses also show some bit of strain hardening. Just quite interesting to read. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Harsha. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Ervina and Dr. Farooq, sir. Um, if somebody has some questions, please do ask. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a, a few questions uh, from uh, the chat box. Yes. And, uh, the one question is from uh, Dr. Mohan. Uh, whether plasticity increases with the micro lying? Uh, it can. It can improve. It can also degrade. It can happen both ways. If you look at uh, this. Uh, this uh, slide, uh, he, they have done microalloying only here. So the glass is palladium nickel phosphorus, and they have added very little of iron, 0.6 uh, atomic percent, and they also added like one atomic percent of cobalt here. And uh, if you see the compression behavior, uh, with iron, just a bit of iron has, uh, without any microalloying, the glass, the blue curve, shows some uh, plasticity already. But with some microalloying with iron, the plasticity has come down drastically. But with cobalt, if you see, again, plasticity has improved. So uh, there is no definite answer uh, whether microalloying improves or degrades. It depends on the chemistry again. So uh, one more question is from uh, Dr. Ramanujam. Uh, yeah. Is there any possibility uh, to apply this uh, metallic process for Automotive applications. <laughs> um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I can say yes, but it's not necessarily true because the problem is producing these glasses in bulk scale is um, is not very easy uh, because uh, the uh, if you I mean I haven't described about how a glass is produced here. But in, gen in general, uh, if you take a normal silicate glass, all you need to do is melt the glass and then pour it in uh, some uh, dye, and then you get a uh, window glass, very easy. Whereas in a metallic glass, it doesn't happen. When you pour it, you get normally crystalline material. So what they do is they do rapid quenching. They use uh, some melt spinning or something where they pour the glass, or they use suction casting where they have very high cooling rates, like 10 per 6 Kelvin per second or so. So when you have that high cooling rate, you can imagine that if you have a die, let's say you have a cylindrical die, the surf, the uh, car, the edge, the surface of the die uh, would give you more cooling rate, but the interior of the rod or whatever you want to cast will have less. So you can have a glass at the surface, and you can have a glass at the uh, you can have a crystal at the center, uh, which may not help. So uh, the problem is uh, producing them in a bulk scale is not easy. And the other problems are there, uh, there are still the fatigue properties of these are also not uh, very clearly uh, or not great in some cases, although they have some ductility. So I would probably use them as some kind of functional application like this biomedical devices or uh, some kind of uh, resistance heat patches recently people are developing. So that kind of things I would use. Yes. So, uh, question from, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, from uh, last question from my side, uh, yes. Dr. Sivaram, yeah, Dr. Sivaram Krishnan is asking a question. 
whether uh, this metallic classes can be machined with uh, uh, any precision machinery equipment have you done any experiment uh, no i haven't done myself uh, any precision making but um, uh, uh, glasses in general can be like i showed you in this uh, previous slide they can be easily blown and you can easily made into very precise shapes Uh, the good thing about these uh, precise shapes is glasses have when you let's say uh, when you cool a liquid and make it into a crystalline form uh, uh, you have a solidification shrinkage right because liquid has a higher uh, volume and solid has a less volume so you uh, there is some shrinkage so you lose something whereas in uh, glasses uh, you can directly um, melt it and pour it in uh, in a die and you can get exact shape of the die you can get near net shaped components because there is no solidification shrinkage in glasses because it is almost retaining the liquid crystal structure so uh, you need not machine the component to make it uh, to make it a very precise shape uh, but if you wanted to do for some other application some machining or something uh i have no idea but uh, i think uh, you can machine them in principle but i'm not sure Uh, how the temperature would affect or how the ductility of that glass would affect so you, one has to be very careful in that sense yes so over to dr farooq sir uh, please ask yes uh, i i like to ask a question you know when you are melting this glass what kind of uh, furnace what kind of a refractory environment uh, we use um typically they don't uh, they don't melt uh, i mean the glasses most of them are made by suction casting okay uh, in such a scenario they use arc melting they don't use typical uh, furnaces so they use an arc and the 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 mold not, not the mold but the uh, Uh, contact of the metal is with some copper uh, copper plate but the thing so, is the copper plate is constantly cooled so it does not react or anything yeah so if you even if you use an arc furnace uh, yes. the lining the lining of the furnace is copper not any refractory that's what you are no, no 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 if you use an arc furnace the lining of the f- yeah the lining is the copper but yeah. uh, if you, you can also people have done tried to make some uh, semi solid processing also uh, mm-hmm. in that cases the lining is uh, i mean you can use a normal uh, crucible whatever you want and uh, mm-hmm. the lining of the die is then some kind of uh, steel or cast okay. iron or something yeah mm-hmm. okay right thank you yeah any question from uh, dr ervina uh okay uh, i have one questions so one is um if i'm a new researcher uh what kind of considering i i need to uh, do uh, especially on the selection of uh, the material uh, on the metallic um, metal materials what uh, kind of base material but uh, depends on what application you want to use it for uh, okay. if you are let's say using uh, it for uh, yeah. biomedical or something normally people go for some titanium based alloys or something like that so you go for uh, titanium based metallic glasses for some kind of biomedical applications but if you are looking for strength in the material then i would go for something like iron based glasses or something but uh, the iron based glasses although they have strength they are very brittle so then i would probably go for uh, um, if you need some strength and some ductility then i would go for maybe uh, copper based or uh, palladium based or some kind of glasses like that for both strength and ductility a little bit of both so it depends it depends on the application you are looking for uh, what kind of uh, chemistry you want to know okay uh, the second question is um about the futures um what kind of um you already done a lot of research on this metallic uh, glasses so uh 
now we have a new materials uh, like vanadium oxide do you think this material can be one of metallic glasses uh normally making oxide glasses uh, other than mm -hmm. silicates are very difficult but it's not impossible mm -hmm. you can also make by like chemical roads people have tried to make some kind of uh, amorphous oxides uh but they are all in powder forms mostly uh, although if you make also you need to center them or something to use them in uh, some kind of application which is uh, the difficult part um but regarding the future of uh, generally metallic glasses as such uh, um i although they are very interesting to study there's a lot of research on this uh, people have tried to make products like the slide i'm sh showing here the uh, application as such of glasses is still uh, i don't know if it will be ever successful or not i cannot confidently claim that because glasses have been discovered in 1960 metallic glasses i mean not the silicate glasses have been there much before uh, long back old and days also people have done it so mm -hmm. but metallic glasses were discovered in 1960 so it's been 6 years uh, but still the progress is there but still they are not uh, to the extent of that they will go into application tomorrow so i don't know maybe it will take another uh, 10 15 20 years yeah okay thank you yeah uh, yeah there is one question from uh, kumar uh, yes a common question uh, uh, how is the research scope in germany for young researchers it's quite good uh, but it depends on uh, what you want to do again uh, but in general uh, you get to have a lot of facilities and if you go to a good group you can do good work in general yes yeah so uh, uh, any further questions uh, uh, from dr revina and dr farooq sir yes yeah yeah i have another question about the optical properties of metallic glasses now how do you comment on the transparency and translucency of these optical glasses they are completely opaque completely opaque okay. yes because they are made of metals you all the bonds which you see they have no band gap at all they are like mm. any 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 metal any crystalline metal so they are uh, completely opaque so looking at them you would think them as any normal metal only when you look at the microstructure you will realize they are amorphous that's all so yeah they have no band gap at all okay fine thank you yeah yeah so uh, i would like to conclude uh, the session uh, i personally uh thank uh, dr stay harshanandam the session was highly informative and you covered the fundamentals very beautifully it was a very beautiful session uh, no one can uh, expect uh, uh, and uh, the reason behind inviting dr harsha is to motivate the young researchers working on materials and also is stock motivated to do research in abroad particularly in germany and some of the highlights of his talk are fundamentals of metallic materials he covered extensively and zirconia based bmg composites and uh, composition specific metallic glasses and uh, uh, even one of the participants also made a question and the plasticity increases with micro lying so that was a beautiful phenomenon and he covered uh, the nano glasses Uh, nicely he introduced uh, uh, the nano glasses and uh, metallic glasses as biomedical devices how the growth of uh, uh, fibroblast cell and particularly micro patterning he discussed uh, very nicely and uh, many questions are there in the chat box maybe uh, through offline mode i can get answer from dr harsha uh, and on behalf of uh, egsl a group of institutions i thank uh, the chairman secretary trust members uh, ceo principal directors deans hods faculty members for continuous support in conducting international webinar particularly i thank uh, dr ervina abzan uh, from multimedia university and dr uh, farooq sir from southeastern university of sri lanka for continuously encouraging me 
to conduct uh, 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 these kind of programs regularly. And uh, now over to uh, Dr. Farooq, sir. Yes, I. you have covered uh, you know, most of the things what I want to say as well, whatever it is. Now, it is my duty to thank Sri Harjanandam for coming out with a lot of information within a short period of time on this particular topic. Thank you very much for your contribution and we wish you all the very best on behalf of the Southeastern University of Sri Lanka to continue your research in this area of materials. Thank you very much. Yeah. Over to Dr. Ervina. Okay, uh, on behalf of Multimedia University also, uh, uh, we would like to uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Sivaraman uh, for organizing this uh, event, this webinar, uh, and also the speakers, Dr. Hafsha, which is uh, uh, the title on the metallic glasses is very uh, nice, very excellent presentations. So we also hope that uh, uh, you, uh, you will continue your great job in uh, doing uh, research in, in this area and all the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I once again thank uh, Dr. Uh, Harsha. Uh, now, uh, when he started the presentation, he joined the uh, webinar room around 7 a.m. in the morning. So, uh, I wholeheartedly thank Dr. Harshananda uh, for supporting our initiative. On behalf of uh, ETS Play Group of Institution, on behalf of Multimedia University, and on behalf of Southeastern University, I thank you for your presence. So, with this, I close the webinar room. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Bye. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay then. See you. Okay. Bye. Huh? Bye. 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 Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah.